Thank you, everyone. My name is Sam, and on behalf of Book Soup, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for our next virtual event with Paria Hasori and Tembi Locke to discuss Paria's debut memoir, Found in Transition, A Mother's Evolution During Her Child's Gender Change. We're so excited and grateful that our bookstore can continue to bring authors and their works to our community during this time and expand even outside of LA. So thank you, everyone, for joining us from afar. And we'll be hosting more virtual events in the near future which you can learn about on our website. Um, you can also sign up for our newsletter and follow us on social media at BookSoup. Our next event is actually scheduled for tomorrow, same time, with Justin Michael Williams to discuss his book, Stay Woke, A Meditation Guide for the Rest of Us. And this evening's virtual event will end with a Q&A, which you can submit a question by going to the Ask a Question section at the bottom of the screen, right under all the videos, and just input your question there. And if you see a question on the list that you'd like for our speakers to answer, you can click the Like button to bump it up a little bit, and we'll try to answer as many as possible. If we don't get to them all, we have um, a message I will let Paria explain to you later, but we have another way that you can ask questions later. And please consider supporting our bookstore and our authors this evening by purchasing a copy of tonight's featured book if you haven't already, which you can do at the green button below. It won't interrupt the viewing, so you can do that at any time throughout the evening. I will also share a link to the audiobook if you prefer that goes through BookSoup if you want to still support us that way. And with that said, let me introduce our guest speakers for this evening. Paria Hasori, MD, is a pediatrician, mother of three, and transgender rights activist. She is a public speaker and has written articles for multiple media outlets, including the New York Times, which came out this week, Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post, and the Huffington Post, and presented stories on stage through expressing motherhood. A proud Iranian-American, she spent her formative years in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and she currently resides and practices in Los Angeles. Thank you, Paria, for being with us tonight. Thank you. And our other guest this evening, Tembi Locke, is the author of the New York Times bestselling memoir, From Scratch, a memoir of love, Sicily, and finding home, which begins with meeting her husband, Sorrow, a Sicilian chef on a street in Florence, and follows their cross-cultural love story over the next two decades. A Reese Witherspoon book club pick, From Scratch, also chronicles the three summers that Locke spent and Locke, sorry, Locke and her daughter spend the sleep following Sorrow's death as they begin to piece their lives together again. Finding solace in her mother-in-law's presence and nourishment at her abundant table, Locke is able to reflect on her and Sorrow's incredible romance and forge a new relationship mm -hmm. with his family. Called Incandescent and Lyrical, the book is being adapted as a limited series for Netflix by Hello Sunshine and starring Zoe Saldana. Tembi is also an actor, advocate, and TED Talk speaker, and I will also share links to From Scratch if you are also interested in that book. And without further ado, I'm going to turn the camera over to our amazing guest this evening. Thank you both for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yay. I know, right? So. I got teary just listening to your intro because I remember when we first met mm -hmm. and my book was yeah. just about to come into the world and we were, um, I was a guest at, in a writing group, Shoshana yeah. Kimmy's writing class. And you, there was something, I just, when you shared, and in my imagination, in my memory, it's like you shared three sentences of this potential book. And I was like, what? I have to know that book. What is that? And I, this book needs to be in the world. And here it is. And here yeah. we are. And I'm so proud of you. I'm oh. just so proud of you. Uh, thank you so much. You know, I remember that so well because we had just gotten an excerpt of your book um, to read in preparation for you coming to class. And that excerpt was so incredible when I read it and I was like oh my gosh this is how you open a story and how you tell a story and so then when we had to go around and just give our little uh you know blurb I was so nervous and so I kind of you know just mumbled out my blurb and then I I, mean, I looked and I could see that on your face you were intrigued and I it was it was uh, such a great moment for me. I, like I knew there was something there. Um, and I have to say, I doing this event with you in particular, I mean, not only are you a super bubbly, fun, you know, incredible person, but I think, you know, we wrote about very different subjects, but we 
you know, both do write about, and I don't, you know, want to compare my writing, you know, to your level of, uh, you know, writing um, <laughs> since you're a New York Times bestseller. But, you know, we both wrote about, um, you know, grief, uh, acceptance, identity, culture, motherhood, uh, but related family. to, separate, you know, yes, family, um, two completely separate sort of incidences. And so it's just, you're like the perfect person to agree yeah. to do this for me. <laughs> First of all, you didn't have to ask me twice. I, when, when your book came through and I read it in Galley, I thought this is a game changer. And thank you for your kind words about my book, but I just want to thank you. I want to start off the conversation by thanking you, by thanking you for what I say, accepting the call into action in your heart to write this book because it is a love letter it is it is it is advocacy it is honest it is pure it's it's about it's vivid there's struggle there's joys and that is what good reading is um and i could talk to you for days about it um and it's relatability and the ways that it is um about many themes there's the big theme and then there's so many sub themes that are playing out beautifully in this book. Um, and I just want to begin um, with the beginning because the beginning of this book. So here we have a physician, a pediatrician, no mm -hmm. less, right? Whose job it is to comfort parents and to help them navigate and guide them. And you open this book being thrown in the deep waters, yes. in the deep unknown, right? And that opening chapter, talk about a vivid way to open the book. And for those of you who will buy the book, buy the book. <laughs> it is so good. You see, it's like all my little dog-eared parts here. Um, that opening, and I just want to give a little bit of a, of a header to it, to the conversation, because you're right, that, that way that we draw the reader in, the way you draw the reader in, and you and your husband are in Thailand, yeah. It's a beautiful moment. It's a great moment to connect. You're on a yoga retreat. It's like I'm go. I was reading. I was like, I want to be there. And then this phone call comes. The yeah. phone call. No parent wants to get, which is you're halfway around the world, and you get a call from your child's school saying that your child is harming themselves and that they have something they want to tell you. Yeah. I mean, you drop us into that right away in that first chapter. And it's so beautiful. How did you, when did you know that was going to be the opening of your book? Um, I think um, it, it was the moment where my life changed. It's, it's a, I mean, when the phone rang at 5 a.m. in Thailand, I knew something was up. Um, and like before I even answered it, my heart dropped. Um, and, you know, we kind of, now we have moved on from this, but there was two years where our life was before May 24th and after May 24th. Um, and so it was such a, you know, a pivotal uh, moment that, you know, I knew it was sort of was how I had to open this, this story. Well, I, I love it because at first, you know, it is that sort of, and I, and I do, you know, we could talk, we will talk, I hopefully about lots of things and I'm sure we'll have lots of great questions, but I really want to, I know you're doing lots of interviews and people are coming to you with many different ways to talk about this book, but for our time today, I would really love to sort of spend some time talking about this motherhood piece, because I think that that there's a big, I mean, it says a, a mother's evolution, <laughs> right? And you really render that. And so that starting point is so critical. And the way that from that moment in Thailand, and then, you know, you guys are on a plane, you know, not the next day, but yeah. shortly thereafter, and you're home. And when you get home, you know, you have this moment, and in, 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 as I was reading it, I was like, oh, goodness, because it was like you're, you're now saying to yourself, I'm back home. There's no way. There's just no way. I know my child, and I'm a pediatrician. Yes. Like, I know this, right? Yeah. And that absoluteness is what we, we have to wrestle with and what you're wrestling with. And um, can you talk a little bit more or read sort of this early part of the book where you are really wrestling with this inner sort of dilemma between the mom, the pediatrician in you, the part of you that is really convinced you absolutely know your child and yeah. really are in that, I guess they would call it denial phase. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, 
when, so, you know, in our particular case, and part of writing the story was that Ava really, we didn't think she had any signs of being transgender before she came out. So when you have a, you know, 13 and a half year old um, who you've thought of and known as a boy, you're, you know, for all the years of mothering her and have never for a second thought that she may have any sort of gender identity, you know, question or issue. And they, you know, sit and tell you that I'm a girl. I mean, it's, you know, it's like the rug is pulled out from under your feet. And, you know, honestly, I mean, a lot of the initial was um, anger, you know, <laughs> because I thought that she was, um, that this was just um, an attention getting, attention seeking um, kind of behavior. Um, and I felt like I don't have time, you know, I don't have time for this. Well, this is what was so great about the way you write about it so honestly, and it's so relatable because, you know, you're a busy mom of three, you know, you sort of like give us a high level view of like your kids' personality types. And you're like, wait a minute, hold on here. You know, let, let, I, I know my kid, I think this is just this. And I felt one of the gifts of this book is that rock bottom honest place that you take us and you don't really hold back. Right. You say you, you give us your doubts. Yeah. You give us all the ways you were, you know, not there. You weren't ready yet. And right. and push back. Right. Um, yeah, I think I really wrote this while it was I mean, I sort of started it while it was still happening. So it was very raw and very fresh. I mean, even right now, when I go back and read it, that person is almost unrecognizable to me because things have changed so much in, in such a short period of time. But I really wanted to um, capture it um, exactly you, you, how it how it was. <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, it's, these are, I think, thoughts that a lot of parents have when something like this, you know, comes up out of the, what seems like out of the blue for their child. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of it was just, you know, there was the anger and then there was just kind of like, you know, while I didn't believe her, it was also like, what kind of mother am I that my child is resorting to this to get my attention or is so unhappy that she thinks being trans is the answer? I mean, there was a lot of questioning myself as a mother, um, you know, forget questioning myself as a pediatrician, but really just, you know, as a mother, you know, what kind of mother has, have I been that I've raised a, ch a child who's uh, completely confused, who needs to resort to this, you know, to get my attention. Um, and so there was a lot of um, struggle there, you know, internal struggle for me. Um, and I was also just tired, <laughs> you know, um, she in particular um, had kind of battled depression off and on. And I had, um, had to um, take care of, you know, things and have dealt with phone calls, you know, from school uh, for years. And it was just, you know, it was like, and she had finally seemed like she was um, happy. Um, and then I was hit with this and I, and I was just tired. So I had the worst reaction a parent can have when a child comes and tells you something, you know, so big. And what's so beautiful in the book is that we're right there with you. So you really center us in, you know, sort of your your point of view. Obviously, you're the memoirist. You're writing about it. But we're really going, OK, I can kind of see this. But we're also going, wait a minute. There's she's got a journey to go on. And I want I want you if you if you would, because mm -hmm. I would really love to hear a section of this book. And we mm -hmm. talked about this this one section of the book in your voice, because I think it really like will read anyone listening right now, hearing this will know sort of what you are up against. So if you would share this with us, I would, it would be a gift. Um, sure. Um, so this um, is on page 76 in the book. Um, it's in the middle of a chapter called drowning. And it's sort of um, at a point where I, th I think I'm, um, gone from like anger and denial to grief, or I'm somewhere in a mix of all of all of those. Um, so it'll be just a couple of minutes. Um, as reality started to set in, my emotional state continued to deteriorate. I remember running into another pediatrician, Monica, in the hospital when I was there to see newborns for our practice. When she asked how I was doing, I started crying and told her everything. 
I didn't know how to lie and just put a smile on my face and say I'm fine and make small talk. If I let myself stop to think, I cried. I just had to go through the motions of my day. I remember comparing myself to women whose husbands have a double life and who claim they had no clue. I would always criticize those women. How could you not have any clue? You are in denial. You are choosing not to see what your husband was doing. How could you not have any clue that your husband had this whole other life? During this phase, I realized that maybe it was possible to have no clue. Here I was as a mother and a pediatrician who had not had any clue whatsoever that my child was trans. I criticized myself as a mother over and over. I kept going back to the thought that all I had ever wanted to be was a mother, that 90, motherhood was 90% of my identity, and I was a terrible mother. How could I not have known? I had always sensed something was off with Ava. I was always afraid of finding out she had been bullied or abused or discovering something else to explain her sadness, her loneliness, and her difficulty making friends. But I never had an inkling that the something could be this. I had considered the possibility of her being gay, but never the possibility of her being trans. I didn't know the signs. The gender of my kids was a part of my identity. Whenever parents at work asked me about my kids, I described myself as a mom of two boys and a girl. When I met parents who had two boys and when were pregnant with their third child, I told them how I didn't think I'd ever have a girl, and I did. It was part of my story, a part of my history. What was my identity now? A mom of a boy and a girl and a possible trans girl? A mom of two girls and a boy? How long would it take for me to go from saying, I have two daughters and one son to actually believing it, to feeling it in my core, to making it my new true identity. Would I ever get there? Would I ever get there? Yeah. That, I mean, that is the journey we get to go on yeah. you with in the course of this book. And it's not just, will you get there? Because we know you've written the book, you got there. Right? Well, I, work. Work. I got there. <laughs> yes. Yes. Right. You're there. Yeah. But it's the how and it's the steps. And I mean, I think one of the, the reasons we read story, fiction or nonfiction, but definitely memoir, is we want to know how did someone do that? Right. You know, what com what what did they learn? Um and and, 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 and in so doing by reading their life, we get to evaluate, think about, reflect on our own lives, right? And I found myself throughout this book reflecting on many aspects of my own motherhood. I don't have a trans child. I have, you know what I mean? So, so that is the universality of the journey that you take us on, even though it's rooted in a very, very specific family story. And you talk about, you just said it, these, one of the themes in this book is that was my identity. Mm -hmm. as a mother and identity is one of the sub themes of the book i mean it's it's a, it's a big theme right yes identity but there are many other kinds of identities that are being um looked at over mm -hmm. the course of the book right yeah. yours as mom yours as you know um an immigrant daughter um yours as a pediatrician you know all, all these sort of you know um parts of identity. And I even love that one of the sub themes is running. And I, I don't know if we'll get to it tonight, but like I found the running piece that, is run, that runs through your book mm -hmm. to be really um, a way that you are using that to process your grief and mm -hmm. your writing. And that's, that's another theme in the book. Yeah. So one of the things to go back to that chapter called drowning, which by the way, is one of my favorite chapters in the book. And I say favorite because it's so powerful. Like you really, as a writer, you get in there and you give us that moment when you are at sea, you are just at sea and you don't, you are trying to sort of reimagine and build and you're bumping up against things. Um, and I want to know that when you, I want to ask you when you were writing the book, when did like that chapter in particular, mm -hmm. do you remember feeling like shifts in who you were becoming as a mom as you were beginning to really meet Ava where Ava was. Like everybody else in the world just had to get caught up to where Ava was. Ava yeah. knew what Ava needed. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Real clear. And yeah. by the way, I mean, oh, like just I loved her from like page one because I'm like, I see this child who is up against so much. 
Mm -hmm. And many places in the book, you write about how she is her own advocate when you weren't even able yet to be yeah. her advocate. It didn't even occur to you. She yeah. was already navigating these things. That was eye-opening, right? Yeah. For me, yeah. um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, she went to the school counselor, you know, in ninth grade and said, you know, I'm you know, this is what's going on. I need a private place um, to change. Um, and this, you know, this was something that I should have done for her, but she did it for herself because I was in anger and, and you know, denial. And so she was, they, the school arranged for her to change in a private area um, for a PE class. And she was doing that for months before I knew about it. Um, then there was, you know, period where I was, um, switching her, you know, from one therapist to another. So she went and arranged to meet with the same counselor once a week, um, have consistency? to have consistency while, so in school, she had this consistent counselor that she was meeting with once a week that I didn't know about until December when I got a call from this counselor saying, Hey, you got to what is going on? You need to, you know, get, you know, with the program. And on the outside, I was switching her, you know, from therapist to therapist. I mean, there, there were so many times that she had to stand up and advocate for herself when I should have been the one doing that, you know, doing that for her. And for um, me, yeah. And for me, as, as the, re I think readers everywhere, when they come to the, to that part of the book, it's very eye-opening, right? Because we're both, I found myself reading it on a couple of levels as a mom, like, oh, you know, our children really are navigating whole parts of their lives that we don't know about, period, end of story. Whether or whatever, you know, however they, you know, if trans, not trans, that's just in, that's baked into being yeah. a person emerging in the world. Yes. But then there's this way in which I'm also, as I was reading it, I was like, gosh, to, to get that phone call, to know, yet again, here's another way, I'm not in step mm -hmm. with where my child is. And that this I keep coming back to that because what the gift of this book is really the way you gently, and not that it's easy, because it's uncomfortable, but you, yeah. you move us through all of these phases so that we begin to understand one how we can love bigger better deeper more openly yes and also how we can be advocates in in the lives of trans people that we may already know may meet may become you know that it was it's really really powerful and um i, I so i really love that you do that and that identity shift to me is was really beautiful in that section yeah yeah, I think the and I think really the first time I um, advocated for her was later on when I finally uh, emailed the choir teacher saying, "Hey, she does not want to wear this mandatory, you know, outfit. Um, can we give her some other options?" And I, you know, sent this long email to the choir teacher. And when I the moment I sent that email, um, and I remember I told my sisters about it. You know, I I felt like oh I. I finally did, I finally stepped in as a mother and I did, you know, something for her. Um, and, um, you know, I, it's kind of what, you know, and I, and I just saw the shift in myself, you know, from, um, you know, being, you know, in denial to, to starting to advocate for her and, um, you know, trying to do some of the things that I should have been doing for her uh, all along. So. Yeah. And I also, I really like the way, so, so the other thing that we're doing as we're getting to know you, the mom, and we're getting to know Ava is Ava's changing and, and beginning to sort of take this leap to stepping into herself fully with your help and with the support of the family. We're also seeing you get you give us a glimpse into the why some of the rootedness, meaning like you share your upbringing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, 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 and and you reference you know being having felt like an outsider growing yeah. up yourself and how some of your resistance initially yeah. was that you felt like I I don't want for my child to move yeah. through the world, you know, as an outsider. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, my parents moved back to the U.S. from Iran in 1983. It was, um, you know, shortly after the Iran-Iraq war had started and then the Iran hostage crisis. It was the worst time um, to be um, an Iranian um, 
in the U.S., except for maybe recently, since Trump has been attacking Iranians again in the, in the last couple of years. But you know, uh, that was the worst time, you know, to be uh, to be an Iranian in the U.S. And um, and so, you know, I just, you know, I got bullied into fifth grade. Uh, that sort of stayed with me. I I felt like my uh, I spent so many. I just I never fully assimilated in in uh, my uh, middle school and high school years and really sort of went to college determined to reinvent myself. And and that's what I did. And um, even though I reinvented myself, there was this um, part of it of, um, you know, like insecurity or just not being certain that I carried with me. Um, we lost we lost you, Tembi. I don't know. If, um, Oh no! Oh no! Yeah, you know, so it'll probably come back. <laughs> um, Let me try to reload. I'm coming back. Okay. So, um, you know, so I think that when you um, are somebody who has uh, felt on the outside in any way, that's the last thing you want for your child. And um, when your child tells you they're trans, the immediate thing you you go to is that you know my child is going to be an outsider, and and this is going to be. Um, really hard. And I, you know, you have so much fear about what the journey ahead is going to be for them. Um, so, so there was, so, but, you know, but then when I saw her be so strong and so sure, I was like, why am I still holding on? You know, why is there a piece of me still holding on to, to what I experienced in my childhood when she is so much stronger at, 14 and 15 than I am, you know, at, in my mid forties. And it was, it was just so eye opening, you know, and it, and so I watched her do that and it was, and it was like, okay, you need to say goodbye and get over your own, you know, things. Cause you know, this, well, you, know, you say that the, the, the therapist and who said that, that I love this line. Like I, I feel like it needs to be on t-shirts and everybody mm -hmm. should like, you know, go home from the hospital with a newborn with it, which is don't be your child's first bully. Yes. So when, um, so we were at a support group meeting and and that therapist wasn't specifically directing it to us. You know, he was just talking to the room and he said, don't be your uh, child's first bully. And it is a moment I will never forget. I mean, uh, Barak and I, both sort of froze and we both talked about it when we left because we, we you know we re i mean i for sure realized i was like i have been her i have been her first you know bully she came to me with this and i repeatedly said no 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 you know no and not that long before that you know she had come to me and said can you um you know use a girl name for me in private and female pronouns for me in private, just so I can feel it out. And I was like, no, am I supposed to look around and see who's in the room? And, you know, if, um, if it's just us use a girl name and, you know, and, you know, and uh, if there's other people around, you know, use a boy name and, you know, when you're ready to come out to the world, um, and you know, when and if you do that, and everyone's calling you by a girl name, that's when I'll do it. I mean, what kind of, you know, what kind of response is that for her to say, can I try this out with you to see how it feels? And for me to say no. And so when that therapist said, don't be your child's first bully, it was, uh, I can't tell you. I mean, no, I, like, when, when I had to put the book down yes. and I was like, you know what? Let me think on <laughs> you know, what are we doing? What happens if you don't? you know, we're, we're, we talk to them about it as though it's outside of the home, but there's yeah. subtle ways. And of course, this was not, a, there were subtle ways. These were, this, you had a very big circumstance unfolding yeah. in your home, but it became a way, when, when you wrote that, I was like, oh my gosh, that is, that for, if, for nothing else, if yeah. people read that and take that away from this book, it is yeah. amazing. But I want to say that there, the other piece that really touched my heart, and I just want to read you one line that you wrote, okay. because powerful to me, which is that with that Thanksgiving dinner. Mm -hmm. So it's somewhere like, I think you guys are like less than six months from the phone call that you got in Thailand. Yeah. Right. So you're, you're, you're sort of, you've had months to adjust to this and now it's the holiday season. And I think you're going to your mom's yeah. for dinner and Ava's going to wear a dress 
Yes. You've told your sister. I have sisters. Yeah. I know we talk yeah. so far. It's like and then your sister called your told your mom. Yes. And then your mom word comes back to you that mom is like not happy or she's like hesitant about it. And then you say this. You said, I am not asking for her opinion or permission. I just want her to know so that she won't be shocked when she sees him. I have to prioritize my child's feelings over mom's right now. Yeah. When I read that, I was like, her mama bear is coming out hard. <laughs> like, yeah. like I understand like to go, I mean, you have, you know, I don't know how traditional or not traditional your family is, but that's yeah. a big statement. People, you know, you were really advocating for your child first within your own family. Yeah. In a beautiful way. And I yeah. thought it was just a beautiful example. I mean, I, there's so many ways I could use that language for many different other situations, but yeah. it was beautiful, a beautiful way. Yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, I have to say, I mean, my mom had actually been incredibly supportive, you know, from, from the beginning, but, um, you know, she would have these same things, you know, you know, where, where, where I had, I mean, it's hard to, um, you know, have Thanksgiving dinner and have your grandchild, you know, show up, you know, in a dress for the first time, you know, no matter sort of how supportive you're being. So, um, but I think, it, it was one of the first times because um, the week before we'd had this incident with her birthday, her wanting to wear a dress and we didn't let her wear a dress and she was, she was miserable on her birthday and I was miserable on her birthday. And I decided, you know, I'm d done watching her, you know, be miserable. Um, and, and then me in turn being miserable for her. Um, and so it was just, it was just like one of those moments where it's like, why am I, trying to protect everyone else and worry about mm -hmm. how, you know, it's going to affect everyone else um, over worrying about her. You know, I was, there was a point where I was more worried about my um, oldest going to high school, you know, who was in high school with her and what would his friends say to him? Or, Why is your brother coming in a dress? And I was more worried at one point about what, my son's uh, oldest, you know, his friends would say to him, then I was about Ava, who was actually the one who was being brave enough to show up in a dress. I mean, now, two years later, when I think about these things that I went through, it seems to me so ridiculous that this is how I handled it. But this is the truth of how I handled it, you know, yeah. and so I, this is what it is, you know. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's the power of the truth. And you're very human about it all, right? Yeah. Because what we're also seeing are these parent dynamics that would be there anyway. What are you wearing? Don't wear that. Do wear that. You know, those yeah. are things that are happening, but the, everything is played out on a bigger canvas. Yeah. Different stakes. And ultimately, you know, you're taking the reader on this journey where you're saying, hell yeah, I'm going to stand up for this for my baby in a way that I didn't even know I could, right? And, and I wanna go back to one of the other themes in the book, which is about the narratives that we have for ourselves. Mm -hmm. You kind of start off by saying like, you had your life planned out. Like I was gonna be a doctor, I'm gonna have this many kids. You, you, know, you, you say this to your husband, you had, you, you know, when you, when you were pregnant, you had very sort of specific ideas about you know, gender and this, that, and the other, and that this book is a lot about breaking open, disrupting, and tossing out these narratives, right? Mm -hmm. But we're often very attached yes. to them. <laughs> we're very attached to them. Yeah. And yet here you have a child who is literally brave enough and willing enough to change the narrative of her life, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. To see who she is. And it's like, do we stand with that or do we hang on to the old thing yeah. that yeah we it was i really had to let go of all my old you know stories and narratives and you know what i you know i had um this vision of you know like you give birth you have this vision for your future you know adult child from the minute they're born and now you're having to change this vision um completely um and but when you do finally do it, it's so much more beautiful than it was ever going to be. So you just, you just, you know, it's about like finally, you know, uh, surrendering um, and seeing, you know, what can happen. And um, 
but there there's a lot of you know struggle you know with that um so yeah i i want to say one of the things that touched me deeply in the book it was a surprise one of the surprises in the book was when you talk about how watching your daughter's emerging femininity right mm -hmm. the, her body the change and how that makes you rethink some of your own messaging about your own feminine yeah. body. Like I did not see that coming in the narrative at all. And I was like, holy shit, excuse me. I was like, this is powerful. <laughs> I was like, this is powerful because, you know, and I, if you, if, could you share the sports bra moment? And I know that that's not yeah. the moment, but it's, it, yeah. it was just a beautiful, yeah, well, the the sports bra moment was, you know, she she asked me if she could wear sports bras at a certain point, and this was still when I was sort of in, in anger denial, and I, um, but I was at the phase I was like, okay, I'm gonna let her do things that are safe and not permanent. So who cares if she wears, you know, sports bra, you know, under her shirt at school? And so I so it started with that, and then it turned to wearing a sports bra where there's like a neon orange strap, you know, showing. And I was like, okay, clearly she wants people to see she's wearing a sports bra for attention um and then there was this this moment where i um you know went to check in on i check in on all my kids you know once in a while you know after they've fallen asleep so i first go to her, her older brother's room and i open armand's room and i you know watch him kind of breathing in his sleep and i go to her. Um, yeah and then i go to her room and i open her door and i see her under the comforter with no shirt but sleeping in the sports bra and my heart just stopped because it was like nobody wears a sports bra to sleep to get attention nobody's seeing her in her sleep if you're wearing a sports bra in your sleep it's because you need to you know feel feminine and and so it was like one of these moments where it was like oh like maybe this this isn't just for attention and and whether or not it's real or it's temporary or confusion it's a real thing happening now that i need to address that's the beautiful thing about um the lesson of the many lessons in your book is like being right with your child right where they are in that moment not 10 minutes ahead you know not 10 minutes ago <laughs> and yeah. that's so hard you know it's yeah. so hard and um, you, you know, you write very openly about all the mixed messaging that was coming from, you know, society, you know, well-intending friends, mm -hmm. um, well-intentioned friends, I should say, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and you are learning how to be right where you need to be at that moment mm -hmm. and kind of filtering that out. And I thought that is a lot of work. And, yeah. and your book is really a testament to the work of love and the work of parenting, the work of being in family, the work on self mm -hmm. that we have to do. And I want to talk, I want to ask you in your writing, you know, how, how was it for you sort of writing about your most honest self on the page? I think it's one of the, I've said it before, it's one of the great gifts of the book, but I know that that could never, that could not have been easy, right? Yeah. To 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 write about that and you do it so um unflinchingly yeah well i think one of the fortunate things that happened is that i have gone um through periods in my life where i've journaled and periods where and i haven't and i would say 90 percent of the time i don't journal and 10 percent of the time i do journal but when this was happening, I happened to be in a period where I was journaling. And so when I went down to sit down and write it, there were so many journal entries for me to read where the these terrible, raw, real thoughts were all there. So it was, you know, very mm. easy to go back to that because it's, you know, I had written it down and, and it was right there. Um, and so, but the other thing was writing this. So when, when all this was happening, I didn't end up seeing a therapist myself, um, even though her, her therapist, you know, suggested that I see a therapist. Oh, no. I, was, I was up to you on that one. I was, yeah. up to you. I was like, wait, yes. um, I was, I was literally, um, I, I think you should yeah. go. Yeah. Her therapist would keep saying that. And I would say, well, I don't have time to go to therapy for me because I'm dealing with all these appointments for Ava and I have two other kids and I have a job, blah, 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 blah. And so, 
you know, I didn't go to, you know, therapy um, during the whole time that this happened. And so uh, sitting down and writing it then, you know, when it did, like that was just, it, I wrote the first draft of this book in four months, which is really, um, I think, like unheard of. I, I think it just poured, you know, it poured out of me um, because I hadn't seen a therapist and, you know, it just, I mean, it, yeah, I think that's the yes, explanation. The other thing is, so sometimes when people are writing any memoir, mm -hmm. and by the way, memoirs often writing about some big wound, some major experience that you've had to live through. Yeah. And that's why it's worth telling about, you know, in the, you know, in a book. And so, but you, and often people stop or they slow down or they're hesitant about it because they're thinking, what will the world think? Mm -hmm. You know, I can't share this publicly or, oh, this is too embarrassing. Or what will my family think? You had the blessing of having people in your life, not the least of which is your life partner, your husband, right? Yeah. Who was on board with you writing this book. Yeah. And also, Ava, can you talk about what those early conversations were like or did people just know it from it was a foregone conclusion i knew you had a blog yeah where they ve just knew like you have to do this um i think um i think i knew that i had to um that you know writing for me was like a therapeutic you know thing um you know before i even started to write this book so so there was a certain point where i started um, writing um, sort of as a form of therapy for myself. And I, I actually, you know, ended up writing the prologue uh, of the book, you know, and at one point, um, and I knew it was like a powerful thing, you know, that I, that I had written. Um, but I think, um, you know, I, I think I knew that this was a, this was the story I needed to read <laughs> when I was going through it and I couldn't find it. And I knew that I could write it, <laughs> you know? I mean, I think that's ultimately what it was because, you know, when this happened, I didn't want, you know, to read um, writing by trans people. That is not the right thing, but that is where I was. I, I, I wanted to, you know, uh, now I go back and read, you know, what trans people, you know, have written. But when I was in that phase, I was not ready to, read and hear what trans people were writing. And I wanted to read and hear what parents were writing. And so when I went and searched for what parents were writing, everything I found wasn't my narrative. Everything I found at that time, and, and there's been more written subsequently, but um, were stories of kids who had presented very young in their childhood. And so, you know, the, so the parents had, kind of slowly started to suspect that there may be an gender issue at, you know, three and four and five and six and seven. So they weren't like slammed with it when, when their child was 13, you know, and a half. And I needed to read the story of a parent who got slammed and was desperate and didn't know what was, you know, going on. Um, and so I knew that needed to be told. And I, um, I, I felt like, I could, you know, and so when I started writing just for myself therapeutically, and I wrote that scene, you know, where I'm ironing her dress for Thanksgiving, you know, I just sort of wrote that as a journal piece. But when I wrote it, I could feel that it was powerful. And I knew that I could, you know, I could, do, this was a project I could do. And, and so once I decided, you know, I could do this, I mean, I discussed it um, with Bach, who was you know, very open to it, and um, and then later discussed it with Ava. Who was open. amazing, by the way. I mean, they're amazing. No, they're amazing. They're amazing. <laughs> yeah. On many, many levels, right? Um, because they are walking you through this, and I felt their presence. Even though some people you only write about very, you know, briefly, they're, they're the presence of the ecosystem mm -hmm. who's there holding you up, and friends as well, and yeah. colleagues. Yeah. was so powerful. You really, without spending a lot of time talking about them, what you give us, the reader, is the sense of the village that it takes. We're yeah. still with you the whole time, right? Yeah. But we, we get the sense of the village that it takes. And I, I, I can relate to what you say yeah. about, you know, when my, you know, in my story, when my, my husband was first diagnosed, I didn't want to read cancer patient stories. I wanted to read caregiver stories. Mm -hmm. well, at the beginning of something, we can only kind of, come at it from 
the experience that we're in, right? It was too right. many, you know. So I can understand why you would need to or seek out a book like yeah. this, not find it, and then decide to write it. Yeah, yeah. And and you know, when I um, discussed it with um, Ava, and I said, you know, I'm going to start it on this day, end it on this day. I'm going to keep it to this. I'm not going to go past this. Um, she was, you know, okay with it. Um, certainly, I. Um, questioned whether I was doing the right thing, putting her story out there uh, because she's not an adult. And um, I questioned that many times. I still sometimes, you know, question it. Uh, but, you know, it just, we, you know, we talked about it and uh, it felt like it was the right thing to do, the right decision for us, you know, at this time to go ahead and do this. Um, and I asked her, you know, did she want me to change her names and use other names? Or was it okay if I use her real birth name and her real current true name? Um, yeah. And she said, I don't want you to change the names. Go ahead and put the names in there. Um, I, you know, there's pictures in the book. So I, you know, had her look through the pictures, approve. There were some I wanted to include that she, you know, vetoed. Um, so, <laughs> you know, she only, she really just approved. It's going to start here and here go ahead and use my names and use these pictures and didn't um, read, you know, anything else that was um, in there um, until after it was completely done. And, you know, we knew this is the final and, and it's going to print. So she sort of trusted me, you know, with that. Yeah. And, um, and my husband, Bach also was like, you write what you need to write. Like he never asked to read and approve anything I wrote about. Uh, I mean, I think he trusted me to, handle it uh, you know appropriately <laughs> um, and so really nobody nobody read or approved anything um and the only people i um asked for permission from were my husband and ava and and and, and that's how it went i love it i know we have a lots of questions um and i want to get to them i just want to say one thing first which is this final chapter of your book yeah I was on my knees. Like I, it, it brought me, <laughs> I just say, when you buy this book, when you get to that final chapter, you just take a breath. Yeah. Um, the mosaic of life and love and identity and humanity is so beautiful. I'm not going to give it away, <laughs> but I want to say that in that moment, I really felt like, you took us on this journey and this book is very much this bridge between the mother you were and the mother you are mm -hmm. right between the child you thought you were parenting mm -hmm. and the person ava is yes and that's a beautiful epic journey to to go on and i can't say enough and i want to open it to the chat because it just but that moment, it was such a beautiful act of love. It's just that the book is an act of love. And so I'm glad that the people in your life were on board for you to do it in the way that you've done it very lovingly, very respectfully. Um, I hope you will talk about choosing the name. I thought that was a beautiful way that you all as a family work together to come up with Ava's name mm -hmm. for many reasons, both the cultural piece yeah. as well as the gender piece, all of it. It was just gorgeous, but I'm gonna, I'll go over here. This is okay. me with, with the cat business. Um, okay. Uh, yes, there's not. Do we have any questions? Let me see. I'm. I know every, everybody loves this book. Oh, good. Well, that's good to know. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you have any questions, I'll say I'll keep talking, and if I see any pop up, let me see if there's any. Early. We have two questions in the oh, underneath great. in the ask a question. Um, the little oh. button at the oh, bottom. Okay. Yeah, I see a little ask a cup question down here. You yeah, right there. <laughs> For some reason, Tembi's not seeing it. So if you see it, Claudia, would you okay. want to? I will. Let me click on the ask a question. Oh, um, did your husband follow the same timeline of acceptance? How did this uh, expectation of masculinity play out, if at all? Um, you know, my husband uh, handled this much better than I did. Um, uh, so he, I, my initial reaction was complete denial. His initial, uh, you know, anger denial, and his initial reaction was like, maybe there's a little possibility that there's some truth here, and and that we should um, listen to it. Um, and so, you know, overall, I would say if um, this hit. 
I don't know. He, he's probably downstairs listening. <laughs> so it should be hard. But I think it hit me a lot harder. Um, I, I do think that um, I, I couldn't have done this without him being really strong and there. However, there were points where I would um, I would get a little bit better. And when I would get a little bit better, he would get worse. You know, it was like if if I was OK, then then he'd have a turn to sort of, you know, fall and crumble a little bit. But since I was doing so much falling and crumbling, <laughs> he had to be strong for, for you know, a, a lot of the time. You know, the other thing that I think um, maybe, and I'm just, uh, this is probably just me talking more about, you know, myself than him, but I think that my, um, I, I think that my identity is truly 90 to 99% mother and one to 10% daughter, sister, friend, pediatrician, wife. Um, and I think that my husband's, I don't know what percent of his identity is father, but I don't think it's 90 to 99%. He's clearly a great father when you read the book that, you know, that's obvious. Oh, yeah. It is not, it wasn't, you know, so I do think that maybe part of the um, struggle was, for me was that it made me question my own identity as a mother so much. Maybe that's why I had such a harder time than he did. And I also, I was the mom of two boys and a girl. That was me. Um, I think he was more the father of three children, always, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so that's just who I was, you know. Um, so that that was part of the struggle too. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's other questions in there. Let's see. Um, okay. um, uh, I will say that your kids' sibling relationship is kind of like parenting goals. Like they are a really cohesive, beautiful unit. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so one question was any advice uh, for someone working on the their first draft of their memoir? Um, I would say if you don't journal, uh, start journaling, <laughs> you know, because, um, you know, if you're thinking about writing a memoir at all, I, I would and, and then and just start, you know, um, and I guess the other thing I would say, you know, for me, I uh, took a couple classes at UCLA Extension. Those classes were made a huge difference you know, to me. I, I and I took two classes. I took Memoir One and Memoir Two. And Memoir, you know, I went into Memoir One not being sure what exactly I was going to write and left Memoir One with, I'm going to start the book here and I'm going to uh, end the book here. And then I went into Memoir Two. Um, with a better idea and um my instructor was shauna kenny who i think is here who is fabulous if anybody wants to take a writing class look up shauna kenny um take a writing class with her because then you'll have a published book so um, we're, we're here to say it happens so i just have to say that for in memoir two um i got to workshop a couple chapters and some pieces the strongest parts in this book were workshopped in my my you know classes so surround yourself take a class uh surround yourself with other writers uh, that's probably my best advice right when let's ask tembi because tembi is an incredible no, 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 no. i did know everything you said everything you said and for me similarly except i didn't just take two ucla extension class i think i took all of them twice yeah. Because it took me that long to sort of really wrap my head around what I was trying to do and write and why and all the you know the big questions. Yeah. But um, I would just say write, 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 and write from your wound. Mm -hmm. Write the thing that scares you the most um, in terms of memoir. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's a you know I was had the privilege of listening to Sandra Cisneros recently speak about writing and. So one of the things that she drove home was really writing from that place and, and, and knowing that you're doing that and nobody has to read it right yeah. away yeah. or maybe ever, but give yourself the gift of writing it Yeah, for first drafts, for sure. Yeah. 
Okay, let's see. Someone else says Shauna's amazing. Of course. Oh, yes. Um, uh, there's a question about how is Ava doing? Um, it, uh, Ava is doing um, incredibly well. I mean, I think anyone who follows me on um, social media, <laughs> uh, on my Instagram, I, I brag about, you know, all of my kids, but um, it, I, um, Ava went from being a child who uh, spent most of her childhood not very happy and not with uh, very, you know, and and having a few friends, you know, at a time, but um, to someone who has an abundant amount of friends, um, is very happy, um, is thriving, is a senior in high school, applying to colleges. I mean, the transformation in her when she was able to come out and be her authentic self is unlike any transformation I have ever witnessed in my life. So, you know, I, um, I want people, I want people to know that trans people who are supported will live the most incredible full lives if, if they're, if they're um, supported. That, that's what, you know, that's what I want people to know. Um, I was gonna, that was gonna be one of my questions is what is one thing you wanna leave, you know, any reader with or you hope people take away from this book? Because one of the things, when I kept reading this, I kept thinking, holy, I was like, Ava needs to run for president. Like, I would vote for Ava for president. Ava, yeah. Ava was like getting it done. Ava was like, do you know what I mean? Like, I can't advocate. Like, Ava, there's something about in her formative years yeah. having to navigate so so much so early. Yeah. And, and, and to your point, the support that she knows that undergirding that she has had and what what that the difference that can make in anybody's mm -hmm. life so whatever she and no pressure and i love that you put that in the book there is no pressure on it because do whatever the hell she wants to do including exactly. yeah. <laughs> but should i ever see her name on the ballot yeah i'm down for it yes <laughs> thank you she'll be she'll be very happy to hear that I'm down um, for it. <laughs> yeah um you know i think um if there is there's a lot of things i would want to leave the audience with but um, one of them would be do not um, underestimate your capacity to evolve and grow when you open your mind and open your heart. Uh, I, the one wish I had, um, which I start the prologue with, is I say, dear God or universe, please let me look at her one day and see my daughter. Not just say and call her my daughter. But see her as my daughter, and I, I'm telling you, I see her as my daughter. Um, so don't underestimate your capacity to change and evolve if you just surrender and open your mind. Sorry. No, I mean that is how I felt reading this, and and it is just it's it's beautiful it's just i just it's just beautiful it's just beautiful it's just beautiful and it's raw and it's honest and it's beautiful and we see such um capacity i mean you give us this gift of the you ask us to bump up against what we perceive as the hard walls right of our ideas our identities um our parenting rules <laughs> you know and then you say, uh-huh, uh-huh, I see that wall. Now take that one down. Okay, now let's take that one down. Mm -hmm. And we're doing it all in service of a human being who has the right to live the most full and authentic life that they can. And that's what, you know, that's what you show us. Yeah. Thank Beautiful. You. Thank Beautiful. you. Um, um, yeah. So sobbing, of course they are because it's <laughs> um, you're parenting me now. <laughs> so um, you are giving a gift to parents. You're parenting other parents. You know that's that peer. There are so many people who are going to read this book and don't know that they need it. 
Yeah. And they um, may never have a trans child. Yeah. I just want to address uh, one other question here, actually, um, which um, is from one of my colleagues. And it says, looking back, are there any th signs that you missed and any tips for parents or pediatricians? And I think um, one of the um, signs that I missed is that she was um, she was always sort of um, unhappy for from from um, probably around kindergarten. She um, would have periods of depression, and no one could um, you know sort of figure you know figure out wh why. Um, and um, she also was uh, uncomfortable sometimes with physical affection and making friends and certain things which all went away, you know, after we supported her and we transitioned her. So I guess one of the things I would say is, obviously there's lots of children who um, have depression or difficulty um, and we don't know why. And there um, isn't, um, you know, sort of uh, like a legitimate reason, you know, for their depression. Like they have a good, you know, happy life and a good stable home and, and all of this. And, and, um, you know, plenty of kids still may have depression in, in those states, but that if you have a child um, where you can't quite figure out what the issue is, um, most of those children are not transgender, but just keep um, the possibility of a gender issue um, in the back of, of your mind. Um, um, and then I just kind of wanted to um, say, because I think we temporarily lost Tempe again. Oh, no. Uh, but we can hear you, um, you know, oh, if, um, if there are questions, you know, one, if there's questions I um, didn't get to, um, people can go um, through my website, pariahistory.com and hit the contact us and uh, email me. I do read uh, every single email that I get and I try to answer every question that I get. Um, there may be uh, parents here who want to ask a question from me sort of in a private forum. Um, so certainly um, feel free um, if you have a question you want to ask me, uh, you know, privately um, to, uh, to uh, contact me through my website and I will, um, definitely respond to, to it. it might take me a couple days I'm having a really super um, crazy busy week but I will definitely respond to to every email your your New York Times piece was amazing oh thank you <laughs> thank you and I do think we need a t-shirt that says don't be your child's first bully don't be your child's first bully yes <laughs> yes so. yeah. um, this has been lovely I am honored to have chatted with you. I'm honored to have read your book. I'm honored to know you. Thank you for asking me to be in conversation with you. Thank you to Book Soup. Thank you to all of the listeners, attendees, people, and, and just we can't thank you enough. And supporting books and stories during this time is so valuable. Yes. Um, and I, I really want to thank Book Soup for uh, hosting this event for me. I really, really want to thank Tembi for everything she has done to help uh, promote, uh, you know, my book and how much she has supported me. And if if there is anyone here who has not read from scratch, like immediately buy from scratch and 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 read it. Um, and I guarantee that you will be hooked in from the very first paragraph. So. <laughs> uh, it's so beautiful seeing women writers support each other and you guys are so wonderful together. So thank you so much for this conversation. It is so important. And I was crying too. It was beautiful. And thank you for sharing all of your wisdom. And for everyone watching, thank you for joining us. I put It's going away now, but I put a link for um, Tembi's memoir as well. And we have Paria's at the bottom at the green button. So please, please. Um, Tembi, I don't, or um, Paria, I don't know if you saw, but you're on our bestseller list this week. So I forgot Thank to mention you. congratulations and let's keep her on the bestseller next week. So you can do that by purchasing the book tonight. And thank you both for taking the time to be with us. And thank you all for supporting independent bookstores and ha everyone have a wonderful night. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.